A pilot and his instructor took off for what should have been a simple training flight. Blue skies, calm winds, perfect visibility. Nothing out of the ordinary. But just minutes later, their Balanca Super Vikings slammed into power lines near Moriarty, New Mexico. One life was lost, another critically injured. Now the NTSB's preliminary report sheds new light on what may have unfolded that morning not to point fingers, but to understand the sequence of decisions and aerodynamic traps that can turn a normal flight into a tragedy. Let's start with the airplane because this particular machine isn't your typical trainer. The Balanca 1730A, better known as the Super Viking, is a high-performance four-seat retractable gear single built in the late 1960s and 70s. Under the cowling sits a 300-horsepower Continental IO-520 engine Sirius power for a piston single, giving it cruise speeds north of 160 knots. This isn't a Cessna 172 or a Cherokee. It's a cross-country performer that demands precision and respect, especially in the low-speed regime. The Viking's stall speed sits around 61 knots, but that number doesn't tell the whole story. In a steep turn or at heavy weight stall onset can climb quickly into the 70s. That's why pilots often describe the airplane as speed respecting. It's smooth, responsive, and strong, but it doesn't forgive sloppy airspeed control. Structurally, it's also different from most aluminum airplanes. The wing uses laminated spruce spars, yes, real wood bonded together with epoxy, while the fuselage is a welded steel tube wrapped in fabric. It's a strong and elegant design, but it handles impact loads and maintenance requirements differently than all metal aircraft. On this particular flight, the owner who had purchased the airplane only a couple of months prior was flying with a certified flight instructor to get more comfortable with its systems and handling. That's smart airmanship getting proper transition training in a high-performance aircraft. Conditions couldn't have been better. Whether at Moriarty was visual meteorological, 10 miles visibility, clear skies, barely a whisper of wind at 3 knots, and a mild 24 degrees Celsius. They departed Sandia Air Park about 20 miles southwest around 10.35 that morning, spent some time flying pattern work, then headed north before turning back toward Moriarty Municipal Airport elevation, 6,200 feet. And that's a crucial detail. At 6,000 feet above sea level, even a powerful engine loses a noticeable chunk of performance. Thinner air means less thrust, less lift, and slower climb. It's what we call high-density altitude. You don't feel it sitting on the ramp, but it bites hard when you need power most like during a go-around or an engine-out scenario. According to ADSB data and the NTSB's preliminary report, the flight approached Moriarty from the west and performed one visual approach to runway 26. That part was perfectly normal. But instead of touching down or climbing away for another pattern, the airplane continued straight ahead following the runway heading for roughly two miles. Then the data shows a descending left-hand 180-degree turn, leveling off astonishingly low between 50 and 100 feet above the ground and continuing eastbound for nearly a mile. Now what were they doing that low? Local authorities later said the aircraft might have been experiencing engine trouble and was possibly attempting an emergency landing or a turnback. It's also possible we can't say for sure that this was a training maneuver, perhaps a simulated engine failure or low pass for familiarization. Either way, that's an altitude band where there's absolutely no room for error. Powerline strikes were reported about a mile east of the airport 40-foot lines crossing the open terrain. After impact, nearby residents lost electricity confirming the collision point. The aircraft then hit the ground roughly 300 feet beyond those wires. At that height, the difference between safe flight and disaster can be measured in seconds. Even with a skilled instructor on board flying that low in a descending turn leaves zero buffer. Add high field elevation, potentially reduced engine power, and the aerodynamic penalties of a steep bank, and the physics start stacking against you fast. It's a chilling reminder when you're low, slow, and turning, there's no undo button. When investigators arrived at the scene, the evidence told a very tight story. The aircraft struck a 40-foot power line, cleanly severing it before colliding with the ground roughly 300 feet beyond the impact point. It came to rest in an open field west of the wires just outside Moriarty. The left wing showed heavy leading edge crushing and buckling consistent with hitting the wires at low forward speed but still under control. Investigators were able to identify all flight control surfaces and control continuity was confirmed from the cockpit to the tail and wings. That's a critical detail. It means the aircraft's flight controls were working properly before impact. There's no sign of a structural or control system failure. Importantly, there was no fire or post-impact explosion, and the wreckage was largely intact. That suggests the airplane didn't slam in vertically or break up mid-air. 
The flight path and damage pattern instead point to a controlled but descending trajectory, the kind of impact you get when a pilot is still flying the airplane but has run out of altitude. And that's the brutal reality of low-altitude flight at 100 feet, even if you're fully in command, the difference between flying and crashing can come down to a single heartbeat. So how does a flight that's seemingly under control end with a collision just a few feet above the ground? The answer lies in a mix of aerodynamics and human reaction. Let's start with the physics. In a 45 to 60 degree bank stall speed increases by roughly 20 to 30 percent. For a Balanca Super Viking that normally stalls around 61 knots, that means it could stall closer to 70 or even 75 knots in a steep turn. Now factor in Moriarty's elevation, 6, 200 feet above sea level, where the air is thinner, the wings produce less lift and the propeller delivers less thrust. If the engine was under partial power or idle, the airplane simply might not have had the performance to maintain altitude in that steep turn. That's how pilots get trapped by what's often called the impossible turn. It's the instinct to turn back toward the runway after losing power on takeoff, a move that feels right but is almost always fatal unless you have plenty of altitude and perfect energy control. Even for seasoned pilots, it's one of the hardest judgment calls in aviation. Then there's the human side of the cockpit. In a training flight, it's common for instructors to simulate engine failures. But if that drill happens too low, or if the engine actually does lose power, things can get confusing fast. Who has the controls? Is it still a simulation? Are we gliding or trying to restart? Those seconds of hesitation are deadly at low altitude. And here's something worth thinking about the startle effect. When something unexpected happens, even trained pilots can momentarily freeze or delay their next move. Combine that with low altitude and degraded performance and there's just no time left to recover. Even highly experienced pilots can be caught off guard. The physics are cold and unforgiving when you're 100 feet off the ground, time lift and energy vanish faster than judgment can catch up. This accident, like so many, doesn't appear to stem from recklessness. It's a textbook example of how thin the safety margins can become when conditions stack up against you. The first takeaway altitude equals time. Every extra hundred feet buys you more options for restart, for glide, for survival. Flying low removes all of that margin. Second wire strikes remain a silent killer in general aviation. Power lines are practically invisible from a cockpit, especially against open terrain or sunlight glare. They're not just a risk for agricultural or bush pilots, they can appear anywhere, even near a well-known airport. Third performance awareness is everything at higher field elevations. At 6,000 feet, your engine and wings are not the same tools they are at sea level. Takeoff and climb performance degrade and glide distance changes drastically. Fourth communication between instructor and student must always be crystal clear. In simulated emergencies, there's no room for uncertainty over who's flying the airplane. A split-second misunderstanding can decide the outcome. So far, the NTSB hasn't found evidence of mechanical failure. All control systems appeared to function before impact. That doesn't mean the airplane was perfect, but it suggests that the limiting factor wasn't hardware, it was physics and circumstance. And that's where the lesson lies. This tragedy isn't about fault. It's about respecting how fast routine can turn critical. You can be doing everything right until altitude, airspeed, and energy converge against you. Even with more information to come, the message is already clear. Respect your margins, manage your energy, and never underestimate how invisible a power line can be. This early analysis is based solely on the NTSB preliminary report and confirmed local details. The final report will take months to complete and may reveal more about the sequence of events and underlying causes. Until then, the goal here isn't to conclude, it's to learn. Because every one of these reports, every wreck, every pilot who didn't make it home teaches something to those still flying. If you found this useful, hit like, subscribe, and stay tuned. We'll follow up when the NTSB releases its final findings. Fly safe, stay sharp, and always give yourself more altitude than you think you'll need.